Greetings and welcome to the latest edition of the Entheogenic Evolution Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Martin, and I'm happy to have you with me today with what is the first new interview being released in the year 2023 and the first new interview marking the 15th year of the Entheogenic Evolution Podcast. My guest today is Jason, who is an underground 5-MeO DMT facilitator who reached out to me a couple months ago, just letting me know that he had some unique approaches to working with 5-MeO DMT and also integration and thought it would make an interesting subject for the podcast. And I agreed. So had Jason on, this was actually back in November when we spoke and just getting to uh, releasing the interview today here on the podcast. But before we get into the conversation with Jason... I do have some announcements. Obviously, I have not recorded a new episode in several weeks because as I had mentioned in those previous episodes, I was away on vacation in Costa Rica and really had an amazing time, um, mostly just in, in one small area. We weren't really traveling around the country or anything, but I was there with my family. We spent a lot of time in the jungle, saw lots of great animals and birds and uh, was just having a great time me and my camera. I also made some audio recordings out there in the jungle, which I hope to incorporate into some future music uh, as I work on new music in 2023. But it was an excellent time. really enjoyed it and looking forward to going back again sometime soon. Um, But yeah, so I've got a little catch up to do with some thanks and uh, words of appreciation. So let's take care of that. Shall we? Right here at the top. I would like to say thanks to some people who purchased some music over the past couple of weeks. Uh, Most of the purchases were also made with a little extra bonus coming my way. So I'd like to thank Robert for purchasing uh, the EP When Nature Calls from my Bandcamp page. I'd like to thank Chris for purchasing the Pure Energy of Unconditional Love, also over at Bandcamp, with a little bit of a tip on top of the $10 price tag on that album. And a great big thanks to Tim, who purchased the EP When Nature Calls, and added in, well, basically he went 10 times over the price of the EP. So thanks, Tim, for that extra support. And then in the PayPal realm, those who are supporting the podcast via PayPal donations, would like to thank David, Brooke, and James. Brooke and James, of course, make a monthly contribution as well as Wes. We also got some uh, contributions, a few small ones by Nick. Thank you very much. A big year-end gift from Sam via PayPal. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And a brand new patron over these past few weeks, uh, River, coming in at the $5 level over at my Patreon page. As I always mention, this is a listener-supported podcast. It does go out free on the internet, so you can always listen for free. But if you want to support it and throw a little money my way to say, hey, thanks for doing it, thanks for putting out the work and the effort, it's always appreciated. It's very easy to do. Stop by my personal webpage at martinball.net, use the PayPal link at the top right of the page, or use the link over to my Patreon page, which is patreon.com slash martinwball, and sign up at the level that's comfortable for you and your level support, and what level of access you would like to get for your monthly contribution, anything from a dollar a month up to $100 a month, and at the $100 level, that gets you a one-hour video call with me every month. And after three months, you get a t-shirt with my art on it. And then there's varying levels in between, and of course, as I've mentioned Um, with the space storage issue here at the Entheogenic Evolution Podcast. Old episodes that disappear from the podcast will be going over to my Patreon page, and those are accessible to everyone who contributes at the $20 a month and up uh, levels. So it gets you access to um, numerous old podcast episodes. Also, something I've been doing over the past week or so has been converting some of the podcast episodes into videos. They're not exciting videos because they just have the cover art that I make for each weekly podcast. And I've been moving those over to my YouTube page, the Entheogenic Evolution channel. So for those of you who like to listen to podcasts on YouTube, well, there's some interviews that I've I've put over there. I think I, I don't know, 10, maybe something like that, that I've moved over there. And I'll be doing that occasionally. I'm not going to be doing that with every episode, um, but just episodes that I feel like sharing more broadly via YouTube. Because, you know, I've got more subscribers at YouTube than I have here at the podcast, but I don't do a lot over at YouTube. 
Um, let's see. What else is going on? Yes, uh, I do have a message that I want to share from Tom Hatzis and Eden Woodruff. Um, as I'm sure some of you know, that Tom and Eden run Sanctum Psychedelia out of Portland, Oregon. And um, they run a lot of events up there. And they also run their own website, which is sanctum.org. Org, excuse me, that's P S A N C T U M dot org. So P S A N C T U M dot org. And right now they are running a Kickstarter campaign. And I'm recording this on Sunday, January 8th. This is going out live uh, on the morning of Monday, January 9th. And their Kickstarter campaign uh, wraps up on Wednesday morning, Wednesday. January 11th. So when this comes out, there's only going to be a couple more days left to their Kickstarter campaign. And what they're seeking to do is to raise funds for the Sanctum Psychedelia Thrift Shop, which is going to be helping to donate proceeds um, to help support people who can't afford the newly inaugurated psilocybin-assisted therapy that is opening up here in Oregon here in 2023. I don't know if any place has actually opened their doors for business or has their licensed centers or therapists available yet, but the projections are that it's probably going to be rather expensive, and it's something that health insurance is not going to cover. So it's going to create a financial barrier for those seeking legal psilocybin therapy here in Oregon that finances are going to be a major issue. So Tom and Eden want to help with that. And you can just zip on over to their webpage, sanctum.org, and you can contribute to their Kickstarter campaign. And there's various gifts and access and things that you get from that. And here's a just quick note from Tom and Eden. They say, psychedelic therapy is coming, but the cost per sessions are high and will be a barrier to working class people and those struggling to meet their basic needs. That's where Sanctum Thrift comes in. Sanctum Thrift is the first thrift store to align itself with the psychedelic assisted therapy movement in Portland, Oregon, and give proceeds to help defray the cost of psychedelic assisted therapy for those who need financial support. Please see our Kickstarter campaign for ways to help. So there you go. If you feel called to do that, head on over to sanctum.org and make a contribution and help make Sanctum Thrift a reality. That would be awesome. And I'm sure Tom and Eden would greatly appreciate it. Okay, so I think that's it for announcements. Um, Yeah, I think that covers everything. Got a couple more interviews in the bank that will still be coming out in the coming weeks. I think we've got like one or two more chapters from the Entheological Paradigm 2021 edition audio book that I'm sharing here. They're going to be shifting gears into another one of my audio books. And uh, looking at lining up new interviews for 2023, still got lots of people to talk to, lots of great information to share here in the 15th year, yay, of the Entheogenic Evolution Podcast. And uh, of course, going to put in a little uh, new music from my album, The Pure Energy of Unconditional Love, after this end of the conversation with Jason. And Jason's going to be talking to us about facilitating 5-MeO-DMT, how he got into it, how he works with minerals and mineral health to help people integrate and also assess their health, do art therapy, and talk a little bit about Qigong and some other elements that he brings in. So he has rather a unique approach. I think it should be a fascinating conversation for anybody who's interested in the facilitation of 5-MeO-DMT. And let's go ahead and get into it right now. Please enjoy and hope 2023 is going well for you wherever you are. All right. Well, I want to welcome on to the Entheogenic Evolution podcast today, Jason, who is connecting with me from Northern California. So we're not too far apart in terms of, uh, you know, global positioning and all that kind of thing, because I'm just here in Southern Oregon. And um, just to introduce Jason, he is someone who contacted me and uh, shared that he is a 5-MeO-DMT facilitator. And specifically in the email he sent me, he mentioned that he likes to work with integration with medical Qigong energy work, mineral balancing, color therapy, and Thai Vedic massage, along with the 5-MeO-DMT work. And we had a little conversation to see if we could uh, expand on all of this and have an interview. And that's what brings us here today. So Jason, welcome to the podcast. How's it going there, man? Thank you very much for having me on. It's an honor. I'm really excited to get into a lot of the integration and preparation stuff that I've really learned 
um, when it comes to implementing it with any sort of medicine work. Yeah, and I think that that's really important that, of course, 5-MeO is unique in many of its own ways. But, you know, when we're talking about integration, that generally the same kind of rules tend to apply across the board. And you definitely have some interesting approaches that you're taking, and we're, we're going to get into all that. But I'm going to start you out with where I like to start people when um, just bringing them on, and especially for folks like yourself. I believe this is your first podcast. Um, discussing what I'm going to be sharing. Yes. Yeah. I've, I've been on many others, um, talking more, you know, just about general health. Um, but with connecting the two, um, this is the first one. Okay. So we're in a situation like this, you know, you are unknown to my audience. So we're going to get to know you first. You know, it's a little bit different than say having an author or a researcher on that people may already know. So Jason, tell us a little bit about, yourself and your background. And I'm always curious to learn about how people got into medicine work for themselves, let alone how they got into facilitating. So first, let's just talk uh, wherever you're comfortable sharing some of your own story, and then we'll get into the facilitation and then all these other tools that you're bringing into this important work. Definitely. Well, I would say the best place to start is to mention that I've had close to 31 revolutions around the sun. So what that means in English is I'm almost 31 years of age. Um, what brought me to the work I'm doing is I've had 16 concussions and I've broken over 30 bones. I was racing professional motocross from age 16 and 19. Um, from age to 16, I was racing as an amateur, traveling the world. I spent several years living in my motorhome. From 19 to 25, 26, I raced road cycling and I raced professionally the last few years. Also had a lot of injuries, and that's what forced me to actually quit road cycling as I had a head-on collision with a truck, and it was a pretty nasty injury. Now, at age 13, my mom passed away. There was a lot of mental and emotional disturbance um, and challenges that happened prior to my mom passing away that really brought me into a stage of suppressing, which led into chronic depression. Now, I wouldn't allow myself to feel mentally and emotionally. So that I wanted to highlight because I get asked, why if I had so many injuries, why didn't I stop after concussion three, four, or five? Yeah. Well, a lot of it was so much mental and emotional pain that I'd put myself in a position to physically hurt myself to make me unconscious of the mental and emotional pain. So that my, was my way of suppressing it. And this ended up leading to a whole cascade of symptoms starting around age 15, 16. With digestive issues, losing weight, I was diagnosed with Epstein-Barr virus, um, I was diagnosed with Lyme disease, I was just diagnosed with all these so-called quote-unquote diseases, and it really led me down the path of being misdiagnosed by a lot of so-called doctors and specialists. So this whole process really forced me to take my own situation into my own hands. Now, someone who's been a big mentor of mine, Paul Check, C-H-E-K, where I integrate a lot of his teachings and the system that he's taught me in going through a certification process into the plant medicine work I do. So it was through a lot of work that I did with him to where he was able to help me distinguish really what it was that I needed to heal mentally and emotionally and seeing this big void in me and seeing that what my body was physically expressing were just reflections of what was happening unconsciously in me. And knowing that really these disease processes that were acting out in me, I acquired into my life for me to really have the mental and emotional healing and growth for me to really translate the wounded child archetype into being in service of other people. So I've learned how to do various techniques of physical therapy rehab. Um, I specialize in high performance kinesiology, uh, nutrition. I've been studying minerals for a while. I'm also known as like the mineral alchemist and making that big correlation into my own health and seeing that be a big missing part that a lot of people weren't recognizing when it came to my head injuries. I've gone through treatments of stem cell therapy, ketamine therapy, NAD therapy, TMS therapy, hyperbaric, hyperbaric oxygen chamber therapy. 
And I had little to no success. Mm. And that's what really took me down the journey of studying minerals and seeing that the mineral kingdom is our constitution of what allows us to be optimally healthy. Wanting to kind of backtrack a little bit into starting the work with Paul Check, that brought me to the awareness through his service that he provides of working with medicines in a very intelligent and sacred manner through really using it as a tool and as a means of seeing what we can't see, inverting the unconscious into the conscious. And if it wasn't for going through that path of working with plant medicine, I don't want to say it's healed me or cured me, but it's been able to see, allow me to see things from different perspectives that have allowed me to have acceptance and forgiveness for myself of what I have done and how I have responded to events that put me in a position of being hurt. And through working with plant medicines, I've learned how to have acceptance and forgiveness for myself so I can have that for other people. We have to forgive ourselves first before we give other people. Yeah. So Jason, let me ask you then. So you had all these diagnoses and you attended to all these different forms of therapy and it sounds like they weren't really doing it for you, including that you mentioned like the hyperbolic chamber, um, stem cell uh, work and all of that. But it's this it's more of this processing of the unconscious material is allowing you to reframe sort of that picture of yourself with that, that wound, that pain from your mother. Um, yet, do you still experience some physical symptoms that you have to deal with? I'm just kind of curious in terms of there's, there could be a difference for some people of having that emotional, mental um, repositioning in relationship to the symptoms that we're experiencing. And then sometimes we do get relief of physical symptoms. But So I'll use myself as an example here. So many of my listeners know that I have a really, rather difficult and debilitating sleep condition. And back in 2019, I went 10 consecutive days without being able to sleep. It was the most horrific experience of my life. Most of 2019 was not the greatest year. And one of the things that helped me shift at least my relationship to the sleep issue was um, deciding that I was not going to try and fix it anymore. And for most of 2019 and into 2020, I was desperately trying to fix it. So kind of like you, I was trying all different kinds of therapies, some experimental, you know, going to all different kinds of healers, but nothing was really helping. And one of the biggest things that has helped me is just sort of accepting like, okay, I need to take AIDS to go to sleep every night. I don't know what I'm going to get. I don't know how my next day is going to be, but I'm not trying to fix it. I'm not trying to avoid fixing it, but I'm not actively trying to fix it or seek solutions, but more of just live with it. And that has greatly lessened my anxiety and emotional turmoil around having this physical condition. So I still have the condition. It's a lot better than it was. And I think that sort of that relaxed attitude has helped it get slightly better over time, but I still have it. So I'm curious how you would kind of characterize yourself in terms of this spectrum of alleviating physical symptoms versus just the reorientation around the difficulties that you're having and what that did for you to help bring you to a new place. Definitely. Well, you know, a lot of these symptoms started around age you know, 15, 16, and really only started to take responsibility for myself around probably age 22, 23. So that's when I was able to start seeing things from a different perspective in a way of realizing that things aren't happening to me, they're happening for me. Mm. And that released a lot of tension and this negative association with my injuries and the emotions behind with what caused my injuries. So I look at it now as a teacher because I still have residual symptoms. Uh, for example, hitting my head as many times a, as I did, I can't expect to be perfect. But again, what is perfect? Yeah. So I have days where, yeah, I have some more challenging situations and symptoms that arise, but I look at it and find meaning in it and understand that it's teaching me something that I haven't been able to learn yet. So for example, if I wake up feeling more tired one day, instead of looking at it as, oh gosh, I'm tired, I have brain fog. 
look at it in a way as what is my brain teaching me? Am I learning new ways to heal, new tools to heal that maybe no one else has been able to discover and learn yet? Can I use percussion sticks to tune my brain and bring different parts of my brain back online? I mean, so using my symptoms as teachers for me to become aware of what I haven't been able to become aware of and realizing that I'm going to be healing for the rest of my life. I don't, I don't want to be done healing. I think things personally would get boring for me if I was done healing. Um, and just coming to a place of being honest and, and accepting the fact that just because I can have, you know, a certification of being, you know, a medical Qigong doctor or a holistic health practitioner, not to get associated with that identity of thinking I'm superior, mm. you know, and I'm in this role of being a coach, therefore I can't be having problems or challenges too. And being honest and sharing that with whoever I'm working with that, for example, last week I was going through a very challenging situation in relationship and being able to acknowledge the parts of myself that have been wounded or that I was escaping from in being able to see the meaning and, and embody it and, and, and integrate it. Um, and one thing that's really shifted a lot for me, instead of trying to clear myself of this energy or clear myself of these symptoms, what about integrating it and embodying it? And that's been a big thing that I've been going through lately is embodying more so the, the symptoms and, and, and taking it in to really go into it instead of escaping from it and trying to, you know, fix it, as you were saying, because I don't think there's anything to fix. There's just things to become aware of. Um, and yeah, I can continue on um, getting into a lot of the things I've learned throughout the years and allowing me to see things just from a different perspective in regards to, I see that when we talk about plant medicine, any sort of plant medicine, it's very important that we talk about health, nutrition, sleep, movement, and engaging in things that create happiness for us. Mm -hmm. Not things that others do for us that make us happy, but things we do for ourselves that make us happy. So Paul Check has a system called the last four doctors you'll ever need. And you can think of it, you and I are both sitting on a chair. Now, depending on the chair you're sitting on, you have a chair behind you, most chairs have four legs. A car has four wheels and four tires. A table has four legs. Everything is created on the foundation of four when it comes to chairs and tables. So you can look at each leg as being a doctor. Doctor mm. diet, nutrition. Doctor quiet, active and passive rest. Doctor movement, working in, cultivating more energy than you're expending or working out expending energy. Now, since as a society, we don't have much energy to expend, we have to become aware and use movement as a means as being as being intelligent to bring in energy to heal because it requires energy to make change. Um, and then doctor happiness. So when we have those four doctors in place, we have the foundation. Now, if one leg is being compromised, it's going to affect all three other legs. So you can see where there's imbalance. These imbalances are what are bringing us to a place to where we are getting called to do medicine too. So when it comes to integration or even just preparation itself, being aware of the four doctors and establishing values and having a motive and a dream as to why you want to change. Because if your motive isn't greater than your motive not to make the changes you want to make for integration, post-medicine work, no change will actually stay in place and happen long term. That I feel like is very important to really integrate in the medicine work as I think the two are interlaced and they're in a relationship with each other. You can't separate them. Yeah. And it seems to be speaking to this idea of not just leaning on the medicines to quote unquote heal you, but that there's a great deal of responsibility that you need to take for yourself to make sure that you are maintaining yourself, that you are engaging yourself in activities that are meaningful and bring happiness and joy to you that you are treating yourself right. Because, you know, sometimes do, people do look at, well, if I just have that psychedelic experience, then I'll be healed, I'll be cured, it'll all be done, and I'll be, I'll be set. You know, this idea of finishing somehow. Yet the, the quest for good health, I mean, I think it's really easy when people actually are in good health and they can feel that way. But, you know, 
for many of us, the older you get, the more likely you are to encounter some kind of health issue. And it can be endemic. It can be something that becomes um, a condition that you have. And then you have to re-navigate your life about how do I still express myself? How do I share honestly of my condition with others and yet still make meaning and purpose for myself because I'm a human being and, and living my life? So it's putting that responsibility back on the individual to kind of create that stable foundation and that's why there's four right that it creates a stable foundation and allows you then to carry on definitely and another very important thing is that we define for ourselves what health is and instead of associating health with how the society looks at health the same with being spiritual as an example you can be a spiritual person and not meditate or do breath work so it's like kind of defining for ourselves and our own uniqueness um, what spiritual growth means for us. What does health mean for us? Because like what I need to give myself to be healthy is definitely different than what Martin needs to give himself to be healthy. So without having comparison, yeah. I think it's really important. Yeah. So let's go ahead and get into how your own work with psychedelics then helped facilitate this for you. And I think you've mentioned before, kind of dealing with the unconscious aspects of the the ongoing narrative of the story that you created for yourself as this wounded person. Um, how did that excavation go for you? Well, I started medicine work with, with someone who's still one of my teachers. I won't mention names. And it started with psilocybin. And that was very impactful. And it was very gentle in regards to it didn't blast open my unconscious it was a light dose and it allowed me to really just be more present and and, and use it as a means of really feeling what i didn't f feel for over a decade and that kind of acted as a catalyst for me getting really interested in just psychedelics plant medicine in general and seeing really what's happening in the psyche when we're doing plant medicine mm. and that's what brought me into starting to do ayahuasca Wachuma, and I did go through a big phase where I was doing too much. And a lot of that came from my athlete background and always pushing it to the limit. And I'm very grateful for that because what I learned throughout those years of not using it really with the right intention, I feel like that I needed for myself to use it responsibly and realizing that the more I was doing it and not allowing myself to integrate and establishing really what integration is for me, it was in a means kind of setting me back because I wasn't seeing what it, it was that I needed to see because I wouldn't allow myself the time to do so. Yeah. Sounds like maybe you were chasing the next big experience or the, the next fascination. Exactly. And I'm very fortunate that I've had people around me that have really supported me in as they've acted as just assistance. I don't want to say guidance, but really opened up more awareness to where I was able to reestablish my relationship with plant medicine and use the experiences I went through throughout those years of doing it for the wrong reasons and trying to just get that next big experience and seeing what not to do. And sometimes in order to see what to do, you need to be able to experience what not to do it's yeah. like when you're in a relationship you end up learning what you don't want and throughout kind of that relationship i had i learned what i don't want to be doing and it allowed me to return back to it with a completely different perspective and then start seeing okay well i don't see that many ceremonies when they're doing opening or closing etc that they're discussing things revolved around nutrition, things around rest, movement, happiness, the foundations that I think are very important, um, along with minerals, which we'll be getting into. And that's why I've really extracted a lot of my background with just health and nutrition into the medicine work and seeing how the two really come into relationship very well. Now, I got introduced to five by one of my teachers that recommended me to work with somebody as I don't want to say I was hitting a plateau, but there was definitely more I was feeling with the previous medicine experiences I had with psilocybin, ayahuasca, wachuma. And I still had a lot of residual 
pain and discomfort, especially in my digestive system. And that's why I was referred to go do five. And I have to say, after my first experience with five, it was like I've never done medicine before. And I had one of the biggest just somatic releases ever. And about 75% of my symptoms completely disappeared, Hmm. which was beyond fascinating. I really couldn't even fathom and believe it. And I would say that that was the beginning of really what brought me on the journey of starting to really work with five and getting very curious about the sacrament and spent a good couple years just working with it. And then it was only from there that I had interest in wanting to serve it. Then I went through not a training. I don't think you can necessarily go through a training, but I just went through a lot of experience with sitting in different group ceremonies and private work to where I was able to see and just learn on how to really be present with the person and how to respond to certain situations that can be very risky. Um, because that's not something you can just learn in a few days um, or even a week or even a month. Um, you you have to really have trust and not have any fear being projected out because they're going to be picking up off that information. Um, and it wasn't until I went through that process to where I felt comfortable in myself to really, to where I felt like I can really wholeheartedly serve this sacrament and take responsibility for working with such a powerful sacrament in medicine. Yeah. So let's go back to that first experience that you had for just a minute. Um, Cause this is something that I've mentioned a lot and sometimes people who haven't had the opportunity to work with five MEO, um, sometimes they take it personally. Sometimes they just don't believe it. But I do like to say that it is in a category of its own that it doesn't really matter how much ayahuasca you've had. It doesn't really matter how many mushrooms you've had. If you haven't had 5-MeO, that this is a fundamentally different experience. And so you've described it as very somatic and as you mentioned, it lessening your physical symptoms of 75%. Um, mm-hmm. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about that and how you perceived the difference at that point from having had a, a 5-MeO experience then comparing it to what had happened prior to ayahuasca and mushrooms and wachuma. And I'm also curious if you've had the experience, as many people do, after they've had 5-MeO and then say they go back to mushrooms or they go back to ayahuasca, that they find that it's going to deeper levels than it did before and sometimes even translates into a 5-MeO-like experience for them. So anywhere you'd like to pick up on that. Definitely. And so a very interesting thing is, so 75% of the symptoms disappeared and it stayed like that for a few months. And then they started to come back. And I kind of went through a cycle of that where they would disappear, then they'd come back. They'd disappear and they'd come back. That's where the mineral connection has really come in for me. Mm. And that's what acted as a catalyst for me to really see how our minerals are significantly impacted in influencing our integration and our behaviors, our personality traits, our habits, addictions, and also whatever underlying condition, pathology, disease we have. Um, I would say the biggest thing that, that did change, even when they did come back, is for me really understanding that it was all really being influenced by my mind. Hmm. It's one thing to be told that, but it's a completely other thing to actually experience that and to see them go away when the mind is cleared of it and then to see them come back when the mind is full of it, of whatever thought or thoughts are orchestrating the matter and creating whatever is happening in the physical body. Yeah. And, you know, even there, I would just like to give a a personal example, going back to my issues with sleep. Um, Again, in 2019, it was horrific. I mean, it was, it was torturous. It was horrific. It was, you know, on the verge for me, it felt like on the verge of death in a really horrible way for a long period of time. And so my mind, of course, reacts to that so that I try and go to sleep at night and I'm thinking, oh, I'm not going to be able to sleep. I'm not going to be able to sleep. And then it gets worse. And then the anxiety and it just builds and builds and builds. And a lot of people who have problems with sleep, they know that their anxiety around it 
makes it worse. Now, it's not to say if you just remove all the anxiety that someone could just magically go to sleep because I'm, I am of a condition that that doesn't happen. But going back to what I was saying before about kind of letting go of or trying to fix it or trying to manage it and just really live with it and be with it, that actually, that reduces the anxiety. And so, you know, these days, you know, I still have trouble getting to sleep, but I'm not lying there worrying about it in the same way that I was worrying about it and not projecting like, oh my God, tomorrow I'm not going to be able to function because I can't get to sleep. And, oh, you know, all just the layers and layers and layers. And so that's where I do have an area of control that I do not need to add my own anxiety to the situation that I'm experiencing. Um, and that sounds like that that's kind of what that helped you understand within your own process. Then of course, adding in the minerals. And I do want to talk more about that. Um, but it's that, it's that mental component of what we are adding to our own condition and how we're judging it, how we're projecting and our own attachments to how we think we should feel or should be versus really accepting where we are. Yeah, definitely. I can, I can really relate to that. And, you know, letting off on giving energy to the things that are taking energy from us. You know, um, that's why I think that that saying is your, your yes has no power until you learn to say no. And as an example, when there are certain things that are coming up, say no. And that's why it's like, you can sometimes name it and tame it. Yeah. And if I have negative thoughts coming up, I will name it and tame it. And it diffuses the energy that is going to that thought. Yeah. So let's, I, I want to get into, um, how you facilitate and how you started facilitating, but since it's come up a few times, let's talk a little bit more about the mineral balancing and maybe share what, what are some of the minerals that we're talking about here? And what are some of the correlations that you see between minerals and mental and emotional state and physical health? How does that Def work? Well, a first a good place to start would be understanding that minerals really run the show. So we have 102 minerals, we have 9,000 plus enzymes, and we have many hormones. And we give so much focus on hormones without recognizing what is influencing the hormones, well, the enzymes, well, what is influencing the enzymes and minerals? Well, there's 9,000 plus enzymes, like I mentioned, and there's 102 minerals. Now, magnesium, which a lot of people are deficient in. I don't want to say everybody because it's, I can't necessarily prove that, but I can say a lot of people are deficient in it, even if they are supplementing with it. Now, magnesium is responsible for 3,751 enzyme reactions. So that's about 40%. So magnesium is responsible for running 40% of metabolic processes. So if we're deficient in magnesium, 40% on 40% uh, of how we're creating energy is going to be compromised. Seeing the cascade effect that happens when magnesium is low, seeing that it disrupts how copper, which is a very essential mineral and, and metal, chaperones iron. Now, if copper can't chaperone iron properly, we end up developing oxidative stress, leading to inflammation, leading to cell death. Now, of course, throughout this process, it is having a direct impact on our mental and emotional stability. Also, each mineral has emotional and psychological characteristics to it and different emotions associated with it. As an example, resentment, frustration is associated with having a low potassium to sodium ratio. Schizophrenia is associated with having high unbound copper, high manganese, and low zinc. Anger is iron toxicity, iron that's stuck in the tissues, and the iron's not getting regulated to the blood. Therefore, it will give a false anemia. That is what is happening at a mineral level, which is influencing the anger to a greater degree. Now, it's paradoxical. Does it, the anger create that deficiency, or does that deficiency create the anger? It's very hard to say, and I think a lot of it is individualized. Mm. Now, working with medicine, 
depending on the medicine, but I would say all medicines have somewhat of an effect on our mineral status to where we can be raising certain minerals and we can also be lowering certain minerals. Now I'm speaking from my experience and how I've seen my clients experience is that it, it is stressful. It's like running an Ironman for the psyche. And that's why sometimes days after you can be tired. So it is causing stress. And since all stress summates, even spiritual stress, doing the shadow work that we're doing with medicine is somewhat of a stressor. Now, I'm not saying it's a bad stressor, but if we don't have the capacity to respond to the stress, then it can compromise us to a greater degree. So if we're going into medicine with low magnesium, just mentioning that one specifically, but it's many others as well that are out of balance. Then I'll mention how heavy middle, how heavy metals also have a direct correlation into this. If one's going into medicine with low magnesium, there's a very good chance that they're going to deplete it even more. So I will calmly see, and I myself went through this, is having awareness and insight, but like not being able to stay present in it it being very hard to actually really stay in it and popping out of it and, and seeing it, but having, it's like this battle. Mm. I'm not just saying just take magnesium or, or correct all minerals. Everything's going to just, you know, be hunky dory and it's going to be easy, but just seeing it be one really important aspect that can really help us really help us really get as much out of the experience and the journey and the ceremony as we can and to really have long lasting changes, even if it's just one big long lasting change. And understanding that some of these conditions, for example, like schizophrenia, even less a contraindication for a lot of medicine, but I know depression and anxiety can get healed through working with medicine, but there are also a lot of cases where it can create more mm -hmm. or it comes back. So I'm not discrediting that people can still have significant healing with plant medicine without focusing on minerals at all, but it's like, well, can we actually get even more? And it's not asking, can we get more from being unsatisfied, but it's just having more awareness around it and seeing, well, there's reasons why we supercharge engines to get more out of the engine. In a way, can we supercharge kind of the integration part or preparation? And if we can focus on mineral rebalancing as for preparation a few months before a medicine experience, then we are definitely going in with more of a capacity to really embody the experience more and stay more present in the awareness and insight we have. Um, so how is this assessed? Is this through blood work, through your analysis? Uh, how do how you determine what somebody's mineral levels are? That's a great question. So in my opinion, the hair tissue mineral analysis test is the most revealing sort of test you can get, I think is better than most blood and lab work. Now I'm not discrediting blood and lab work, but it's showing you a snapshot of what's happening right then, right now at that time. And it can be very unreliable because most of the blood work that they're doing, like testing vitamin D and iron and, and all these other, you know, markers like thyroid T4, T3, they're not effectively really testing it. So you're not going to get the feedback you need. So I'll commonly have, you know, clients that will have normal thyroid function on blood work, but on their hair tissue mineral analysis test, they have hypothyroidism at a cellular level because it's showing what's happening in the tissues. And that's the thing, just because on a test you can show high in a mineral, that doesn't mean you're high in it. It can be stuck in the tissues. That's why it's important to see that with iron, which represents the masculine and copper represents the feminine, you can see this in people, people who are aggressive, anxiety too masculine, it's because they have iron that is, is overloaded and it's stuck in the tissues and it can't be cycled into the blood and it creates hardening. And you see this, especially once you start getting to certain ages and it's even happening for people that are young is there's a hardening effect and that's what iron does. So being able to, 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 to see this really changes the perspective that there is when it comes to seeing really what is influencing everything else in the body. 
and, and focusing on the minerals allows things to start coming back into balance because you're strength, strengthening the host, not attacking the enemy. Yeah. So is this the kind of testing that you would do with clients before actually bringing them in for medicine work then and having this kind of analysis done and then treating with supplements and mineral intake? Ideally, yes. And one last thing in regards to the test is also on the test, it tests the minerals in like an isolated form. So each one individually. And then there's the graph that gives you ratios. And the ratios is the most important graph because that shows how they're working as synergist and antagonist in their relationship they have with each other. So you have to really understand how to interpret HTMA testing because most practitioners look at what's low, what's high, and they try to balance it that way. But most of the time what's high isn't high because you have excess or too much. It's high because it's stuck in the tissues. So calcium will commonly get stuck in the tissues, which will give a high reading on a hair tissue mineral analysis test. So it's not in the bones and the teeth where it needs to be. So what will happen is one will create what is called a calcium shell. Calcium shell is where you're very, you feel stuck because calcium will end up acting like cement. It has an energetic expression of acting like cement when it's in the wrong area. So it's important to also see the ratio relationship minerals have with each other. That's why magnesium for some people may do more harm than good if they start taking that before starting to heal the adrenal glands. Because if the adrenal glands are, are stressed, have it be at the alarm stage, resistance stage, or exhaustion stage, supplementing with magnesium will be like putting air in a tire that has a hole or a leak in it. Mm. The leak or the hole represents the adrenal glands because when there's elevation of cortisol, Cortisol and magnesium act like on a seesaw. So when magnesium goes down, cortisol goes up. So if you don't help address the elevated cortisol by supplementing somebody with sodium and potassium and vitamin C, then you'll consistently be burning through the magnesium. Now, heavy metals also have a, a very significant impact on one's mineral status. Any level of a toxic metal is detrimental to our psychology and our physiology. As an, as an example, high blood pressure is very common. And that is something that I'll calmly have to say no to when I'm doing an intake and they say they have high blood pressure. I am just very careful on who I serve. So I'll say no, unless we end up doing some work together. And that can take three to six plus months to address the hypertension, to get them in a place of safely working with 5-MeO or Bufo as an example. Now, the one heavy metal that affects high blood pressure is cadmium. It's, so it would be important that when it comes to high blood pressure, really what is at the underlying root of it is the cadmium, that heavy metal. So that can't get addressed by doing like a heavy metal cleanse. That has to get addressed by learning what antagonist mineral you can take, zinc as an example, that will help start lowering that toxic heavy metal. So it's all about learning how to bring the body back into balance and learning what you can supplement with that isn't necessarily addressing the ratio imbalance, but addressing something else and it will address three, four, five, six plus things if you know what to address first. Well, sounds very detailed and quite interesting. So let's shift gears a little bit, and I'm sure we'll come back to, to more minerals. And um, as we talk about some of these other modalities, such as Qigong and color therapy and the Thai Vedic massage um, in integration with the 5-MEO work. But let's talk a little bit now about kind of your stepping into the role as a 5-MEO facilitator. And just to recap something that you mentioned earlier that you said that you sat in a lot of different contexts of facilitation, not necessarily for training, but just to get that exposure, to get that experience. Then in deciding to facilitate yourself, um, yeah, I'd like to hear about not only the intake and the screening that you do, 
how you like to facilitate in terms of the session itself. And then um, I think this is where we're going to get back to a lot of these other ideas is with then the integration work and sort of the aftercare that you provide. So um, I invite you to share about that. Definitely. Um, <clears throat> so to start off, an intake is, is number one. And if we end up following through after the intake, and I feel like it's a good fit, um, and that's the most important thing is I want them to know that this is an intimate relationship we're cultivating, you know, and, and trust and honesty is number one. Mm. And I feel like that isn't being met. Or even if I have to be honest with myself and feel like I can't, or I may not be a good fit for them, then I will refer them um, else outward. And I've done that actually a handful of times where I feel like they needed feminine energy, actually. So I would refer them out to someone who I feel like would be a good fit for them. But if they're a good fit for me, then I have my preparation that I do behind the scenes before we go into preparation day of medicine. And it's actually pretty simple, but it can turn into a couple hour process where I do a, a, an intensive tarot card reading to see what it is that I'm going to be working with with this person. And some situations I've had where I, for example, pulled uh, a certain card and what that card was signifying and showing me was to not go above a certain dose or to maybe not serve five, but maybe just do psilocybin. So using the tarot reading to have a better sense of uh, intuition with how to kind of facilitate the experience for them. Now, of course, things obviously always change. It's not to the T, but it just gives me a general reference of you know, for example, if I'm going to be working with someone that's going to be very, you know, loud, or I feel like maybe I need somebody else there to help me keep things grounded, or do I feel like I can serve this person with it just me? Um, so that's kind of the preparation piece I personally go for. And now when they show up, we'll spend anywhere from one to one and a half hours going through medical Qigong energy work. Um, and what I've been doing now is doing like the Thai Vedic massage kind of coming back into the body, coming back into your breath on the medicine, or if it's with psilocybin, I'll actually do massage on them, the Thai Vedic massage and different body work techniques while they're on the medicine. Um, and I've learned that just integrating those two has, it's been phenomenal. It's been really phenomenal interacting, interacting with them in that way. Um, I have interacted with clients on five, uh, of course, not to the degree that you highlight in your books, which I have a lot of admiration for the integrity and how you show up there. Um, but I kind of just, it varies from individual to individual on if I am going to interact with them to what degree, or do I feel like it, it's just good to just sit and hold space mm -hmm. um, and, and, Sometimes I, I felt like it's just best to really just sit and hold space and to allow them to go through their process um, and not feeling like I have to do something, you know, and that's been my growing is, is sometimes just, I wouldn't say doing nothing, but sometimes just all what is needed is just to really just hold space and not having a drum or a rattle or do these things, but sometimes just the sitting in the presence is really the medicine they need. Yeah. Well, let's go back to the, the medical Qigong. Um, and maybe you can help clarify this for me. So you said that um, in the hour to hour and a half before actually doing the work with the medicine that you do the medical Qigong with them. Um, maybe just clarify the, that a little bit more. So when I think of Qigong, I think of doing um, these movements and exercises. Um, so is that what you're engaging in or, or is medical Qigong energy work? Is that something um, somewhat different? Medical Qigong energy work is is different, but not different. The principles are the same. The principles are applied by the medical Qigong practitioner or doctor working with the patient or client. So there's three stages of medical Qigong energy work. Purging, tonifying, and regulating. So purging is removing excess energy, purging anger, purging lungs, and using sound and breath mm actually directly on the client or patient to purge and knowing what to purge, how much to purge, because you can over purge. Tonifying, balancing out the energy where there's deficient, giving enough energy to where it's balanced, not excess. And then regulating, regulating the fire and the water 
um, cycles in the body and creating that connection and then sealing the energy in. Um, so it's kind of a pre-tune up. Yes. It's a pre-tune up. And that's the thing I, I, I just myself value just the detail. And I know the detail is not for everybody. I love really getting into the nitty gritty of things. Um, and I like addressing really what's happening at a, at a underlying root level for them. Um, so the integration can really be effective for them. And with my clients is bringing for doctor awareness into integration and getting clear on your values, getting clear on your motive and your dream that you want to have, you know, coming out of the medicine or even having it be before the medicine. So then when it actually comes to the next stage and you're facilitating with the medicine itself, I'm curious how you like to structure that. Um, and just by point of comparison or reference, um, as I'm sure you're aware, a lot of people these days are doing um, a three-tiered approach of say a handshake, hug and full embrace. Other people just like to do a one-off big hit. Other people like the model that, that I promoted was have clients go in three times at a full dose each time, not graduating up, but continuing to work and kind of uh, especially a lot of things that you kind of mentioned with the medical qigong, that that's something that I would kind of apply in the session itself. Um, but I'm wondering, what is your framework? Um, how do you like to serve and at what levels do you like to serve clients and do they have the opportunity to take more or just how you structure that and what you're comfortable with? Definitely. I do start off with a handshake dose. And then I'll go up from there. And sometimes it may be a hug. Sometimes it may be a French kiss. I have learned that sometimes what would be a hug for somebody can be a French kiss for somebody else. Um, and that's why I do like starting there is just so I can figure out really kind of what is the optimal dose for them. Mm -hmm. Once we find that, we'll stay there anywhere from two to four rounds. Okay, great. So what then determines for you or for the client um, how many rounds uh, they take? Uh, what is it that, that you or I or they are looking for within that? I just use kind of my sense of feeling on just my observation. Um, and you, as you probably understand, you can just see it in them. Yeah. You know, it's like you, 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 you know, the work is, is done. They're good. You know, <laughs> there's just that feeling in that energy in the room where it's like, okay, this, this is sealed. This is sealed. Um, now I've had some situations where I have recommended another one and they said they were good and, yeah. and I do respect that. Then I've had other ones where some clients have said I'm good. And I said, well, I do recommend we do one more round. And I would say I've been, I've had 10 out of 10 times with those clients that I have done another round when they said they didn't want it, but they trusted me to where they're like, thank you. Like that one last round was, was it. Um, and that created to, to seal the deal. Yeah. Well, it's really great to hear because I, I definitely am very opposed to the strictly one-off approach. And I, you know, if people want to graduate up, I think that's fine. If they want to do varying levels, I think that's fine. But just what you're discussing here of that sense of completion, as you say, to seal the deal and that really when people are really being honest with themselves, I think that clients recognize that. I think when facilitators are really being aware that they can recognize that as well. And it's good to hear that you also are comfortable to recommend that people go for another round because sometimes that can be scary. There could be a lot of resistance there, but I think it's just so important that especially if you have that feeling, you have that intuition that in energetically you're feeling like, ah, this person's not quite done yet. Cause for me that that's one of the worst things is for someone to leave a session and not be grounded and not be complete because that tends to be a recipe for a very difficult integration or even complete lack of integration. And it's having that sense of completion for the day that really helps people ground back into their body and into the 3d world and 3d life and really maximize the benefits that they're getting from the work. Definitely. I agree. And, um, you know, I, of course I've learned myself in, in feeling like I could have used another round when I was originally working with the medicine quite a bit and seeing how hard the integration would be for me and feeling like, Oh gosh, I still had a lot more work to do. Um, 
and yeah, you know, at the beginning when I first started serving, I of course learned that, you know, really making sure that they have enough rounds to where it is complete and they're not leaving questioning the experience or they're not leaving feeling, you know, um, kind of just untangled and, and confused and kind of that confusion I feel like can be from not really sealing the deal and going all the way through and feeling as light as a feather, like a butterfly. Um, and that really, I feel like is a full release. Now, of course, not everyone's going to have that if you even do enough rounds, um, but it definitely increases the chances when you do enough rounds for that individual. Yeah. So I was wondering if there's anything you could tell us about the kind of clientele that you're working with. And and I don't know if you're comfortable with the word clientele. Some people take issue and they want it to be patients or um, initiates or, you know, so I invite you to use whatever language you like to use around that. But um, I'm always curious about who is coming for the work. And um, also a question I do like to ask is if you have seen changes over time in terms of who is coming for the work, especially as 5-MEO is really exploding around the world. Um, even just, just today, here on our local radio, they played Thomas Dolby, um, his song, The Toad Lickers. And after the song, the DJ got on the, the radio and said, and by the way, the National Park Service has issued a statement saying, uh, please don't lick the Sonoran Desert Toad. It could be dangerous. And then I opened up... Um, Huffington Post and I was just reading the news and sure enough there was an article there from the Park Service saying don't lick toads. Um, So the awareness is much greater than it it used to be at this point so I'm just wondering if you have anything that you would have to say about yeah the people who are coming for this work and what they're looking for what you perceive there. Definitely um, it's been a variety of of people that are younger in their twenties and thirties and, you know, even working with people up in their sixties and seventies. So there's definitely been a lot of variation with different, you know, age ranges and also with gender as well. Um, I would say I more work with, with men than women, but, um, I definitely had a phase there when I was working with more women than men. Um, uh, when I am hearing their story, I definitely see a lot of mine in them as well. So I know I'm attracting a lot of, you know, parts of myself that can also use further healing and more awareness and for me to share what I have learned with them too and have that similarity. Um, so yeah, that's, that's been my clientele and it's, it's, it's been word of mouth, especially around my area. Um, and I've had, you know, clients as well that I was just doing other work with that had a lot of curiosity in plant medicine and integrating that work. And and that's where my work is definitely leading to is really just focusing on really bridge, bridging the gap with health and plant medicines and bringing in a lot of the mineral um, understanding and integration into plant medicine and really just focusing on that and having just my coaching where I'm not working with medicine be something that I take a break from and and working with the two together. Hmm. So something we haven't really touched on yet is the art and color therapy. So I think that'd be a good time to maybe hear about that a little bit. And of course, nobody can see it um, because only audio is on the podcast, but I see some, you know, some very colorful drawings behind you up on the wall. It looks like even, is that even painted on the wall? It is, yes. Yeah. I um, learned art therapy through working with Paul Check, um, and I use art therapy working with archetypes and working with the different symbolic energies of archetype archetypes in art, um, as archetypes are the root language of the psyche and consciousness. So I connect with the my client's soul, and I have their soul guide me in regards to what image or images to paint for them for healing integration. So that's how I make a mandala for my clients for integration work, as that is a very integral piece to their integration because it is charged with what they need for healing. They just need to be connecting with that painting. Um, Now, the color side of things, which is really fascinating to understand, is we commonly are used to hearing the question, what is the matter? For example, somebody comes with back pain. What is the matter? Knee pain, what is the matter? Now, I'm not discrediting that, but let's see things from another perspective. 
who is the matter? Seeing that, okay, it's actually really not what is the matter, it's a who is the matter which can be creating what is the matter. And that who, there's a color association behind it. We're colored with trauma. Now, everything has polarity, so color has a polarity, healing, and also uh, a, a trauma association with it. So I can give a few examples. Um, client comes to me with knee pain. I ask the client, what is the first color you think of when you think of your right knee? Hmm. Well, yellow. Well, yellow is associated with decisions, indecisiveness, making a decision that you regret, uh, not making a decision at all, regretment, um, and having the right side front knee be correlated to female, left side being male. I know there's also the idea that left is female, right is male. I personally just have the um, observation and through my work that on the back side, left is female, right is male, front side, left male, right female. So color yellow, right knee, indecisiveness, what situation in life related to a female is there a decision challenge? Indecisiveness, did you make a decision that you regret, etc.? So client, right knee pain, relationship, needing to make a decision in the relationship or resisting making that decision. So resisting making that decision gets an input and it creates an engram subconsciously which will create the physical expression. So seeing that whatever symptom we have in our body we can trace it back to a color and trace it back to who with in regards to who is the one that created that input therefore that trauma black father trauma red is resisting a change tra trauma that's why we're traumatized with color red stop signs red lights etc and using feet because the feet are like detectors of what's happening subconsciously in the mind. So you can just feel through moving somebody's feet around, what side of the body are they holding tension on? Mm -hmm. What side is stiff? And then you can see, okay, is it a male stressor, female stressor? Then you start asking questions. And then you can backtrack to who is the matter. So that's how you can work with color and, and see what it's associated to behind it. You know, like even say somebody says color silver. Well, silver is related to speech. Are you having challenges with speech, not being authentically honest with yourself? What correlation is there with speech? And commonly you'll see that in the throat, not being able to communicate. Silver. Well, was there a situation where somebody was getting down on you about what you're saying? Was it your mom? Was it your dad? Was it a coworker, et cetera? Well, that is colored now in there and that color is creating the trauma. So that needs to get cleared. And there's different techniques you can do to clear it. One example, which is pretty fascinating, is yawning. You can yawn and go through the sequence of colors from lowest energy to highest energy. And you can clear yourself of the colors when you imagine each color. And then you follow it up with a feel-good memory. And when you yawn, since you release 84% carbon dioxide through yawning, you release trauma through yawning. It's not just a means of being tired. It's a means of releasing stress. So if we hold intention and imagination with it, we can clear ourselves of trauma just by doing that sequence. So where does this come in within the process of working with the medicine? Is this something that you're doing beforehand or is this coming afterwards or is this homework? Or where does it fit? That's a great question. And since I have kind of different, I would say, packages with clients sometimes i'll just work with the client for half a day or full day or three days so when there's extended stay like two three days well it gives me time to do these things now if it's just for a day it can be hard to fit this all in and it's too much yeah like you no know, as it is it already sounds like doing energy work before and even body work during or after it sounds like a lot but it's, it's actually a very calm process i try to do a lot of the verbal communication and talking during the intake and then a call before we work with the medicine to where when it's in person, I am not expending a lot of energy talking. And it's also not a lot of talking for them. So I, I do kind of counterbalance that and make it calm. But when there's two, three days, when it's like a Friday through Monday or Friday through Sunday, then like on day two or three, then I'll guide them through this process. And then I can give them clear 
techniques and homework in regards to what to do um, to release that color or those colors of trauma. Yeah. So it sounds like in order to avoid information overload, because this sounds like it could be a lot. If we're going into all the minerals, we're doing the qigong, we're doing the color, that this is more for the sort of extended package. Um, and what kind of what kind of response or feedback do you get from clients around these different modalities? Um, I would imagine that maybe some people say, oh, yeah, the qigong stuff is great. Uh, I'm not sure about the minerals. And maybe others are like, oh, man, the, the mineral thing really made a difference for me and for others it might be the color or the, or the art or do you feel that they are equally appreciated i'm just wondering what your reception is of those among the, the people you work with definitely and real quick just to um carry off and piggyback off of what you're saying but it kind of can be an information overload um i understand that and and to simplify that is you know I just am explaining kind of not everything that I do just at once, but just different ways of approaching working with somebody and yeah. not using everything with one person, but using what I feel like will really be the most applicable with that person. And I like just using working with sacrament, the sacrament five and medicine as a tool. And that's why I kind of like integrating other things into it where it's kind of just, you know, uh, a very strong spoke on a bicycle wheel. And the hub being like for doctor awareness. And, and that's kind of the emphasis of everything. And then using, you know, any medicine or five as a very powerful tool to really bring in deeper inner healing work. Yeah. And I think it's great to have a variety of tools, but just because you have a variety of tools doesn't mean to use every tool every time, because once you have a variety, you use the tool that fits the situation. Of course. And yeah. I, I, I've had a, a handful of clients that really just wanted to come and do the medicine. Yeah. They want to, you know, hear about minerals. They don't want to do energy work. And I, I do meet clients where they're at, you know? So it's not like, it's just like they, they're in serve medicine, they're out. It, it is still at least a minimum of like a three hour process, but I won't spend the time doing the energy work because if they don't want to receive it, then it's not going to have any benefit, of course, you know? Yeah. So I, I, I have learned how to meet people's needs and where they're at. Um, response, I would say eight out of 10 of the clients I work with, even in regards to just medicine, um, are very intrigued and very amazed by understanding the mineral aspect of things and having it actually answer a lot of questions or bring a lot of awareness for things that they were kind of you know, um, feeling very curious about and, and also having some challenges. I've, I've worked with quite a bit of people that have had challenges with have it be kind of post integration, um, and, and seeing that it can be hard to really stay in that, that energy and staying really aligned with what we feel like we need to be aligned with. Um, and then having that understanding that, you know, having a, a heavy metal toxicity load, can really be, really be significantly impacting how we're integrating. So once they understand that, it, they're really excited to learn more. Yeah. So what would be your suggestions then for post-session grounding that experience, grounding that understanding, and as you say, like integrating, and for people moving forward, like what do you suggest? Definitely. Well, I do keep it simple and I'll normally only recommend two to three like action items. And one of them is painting. So them to do a mandala, a healing mandala around their experience for them to embody and encapsulate it. So I'll have them paint. Um, the next one is I'll have them get clear on their values that they need around nutrition, um, sleep, movement and happiness. And have the third one be just drinking more water or um, implementing some of the information I shared with you about minerals. I do give some of my clients information if they don't want to work with me with mineral um, coaching or work. I'll give them references to where they'll have information and where they can start implementing some stuff. Yeah. So now with you coming on this podcast and sharing all this, um, I'm curious if you see perhaps developing a new role for yourself. Like this is kind of a, a coming out interview 
in the sense that you're, you're here to talk about 5-MEO. Do you see yourself as bringing this information to more 5-MEO practitioners and facilitators or what, what comes up in your imagination there? Yeah. You know, that's the thing. What I do is very unique and different. And I don't want to be coming across in a way where I'm discrediting what other people are doing. Like if they're not talking about these things or they're not aware of it, that's not to take away from the work they're doing. You can still do really incredible work with out understanding the mineral component. It's just something that I feel like is needed for some people. And I think as there's more awareness around it, people will either be called to it or it won't interest them. And it may only interest them maybe a year from now. Uh, I would like to bring more awareness to other practitioners as I am open to learning too. That's the thing. I'm always going to be a student at heart. Um, you know, that's one thing I've been learning in my relationship is, you know, as Christian Mirdi says, a man who says he knows is a dead man and always wanting to be open to learning. And I feel like with what I can share for people to create more awareness, they can also give me feedback and learn from them too. Um, but right now I'm, I'm really just on a mission, um, and I really, really enjoy and love what I do to just really bring the most to the experience that I can um, and cultivate beautiful relationships and wholeness for people. Yeah, well, it's very evident that you have a strong curiosity for all of these different elements that you're working with. And you clearly have educated yourself extensively in all of these different areas. So again, that idea that you have a pretty extensive toolkit that you're bringing into each situation of working with individuals and working with them through the medicine experience. And it's just a very interesting palette of different shades and different colors and different elements that you're bringing into this work. And it's, it's definitely fascinating just in the sense that you're the first person that I've talked to that have talked about all of these different things that you're using within this context. And so that in and of itself for me just makes it fascinating. Thank you. Um, one quick thing that I do want to mention is the importance of breathing and we breathe on average 25,920 times a day. Rudolf Steiner has fascinating information in lectures about respiration and breathing. Um, if for any reason our breathing is being compromised, every system in our body will be compensated in order to accommodate the breathing pattern, dysfunction, inverted breathing pattern, etc. So it's important that I, I, I inform each client how to breathe properly. And that's why when it comes to integration, the reason I'm mentioning this is just telling someone to just do breath work. Most ways of doing breath work, like the fast Wim Hof breathing, if you don't know how to effectively breathe, you're going to be creating too much sympathetic tone and activation where it'll be causing more stress, especially long term. Um, so bringing the awareness on how to breathe properly, I think, is, is very important. And even just doing slow conscious diaphragmatic breathing can be really good for somebody. Um, and going off the things like just recommending breath work and yoga, I think that still can be good for some people, but I think it needs to get more individualized. Some people may not get really any benefit out of yoga or maybe different forms of yoga. Um, so yeah, I think it, it's, it's a pretty cool avenue to individualize integration for, for people. Um, so they're excited and happy about it. I mean, the best exercise is exercise you'll do. So somebody really wants to do yoga, then that's great for them, but not because you have to, because you're choosing to and you want to do it. Then it can be a great integration tool. Um, yeah, and I really love what you just said about how for some people doing things like yoga or doing breath work is not necessarily going to be helpful because it can just become another thing that the ego sets out as, okay, well, I've got to, I've got to achieve these goals. I've got to maintain this practice. And it becomes another area rather than an, an expression of freedom and liberation. It becomes like, here's more baggage that I'm going to put on myself that if, and if I'm not doing these things and I'm feeling that I'm letting myself down or I'm letting my facilitator down. And sometimes just helping people relax. And I think it's just great. Just, just relax into your breath, breathe from the diaphragm. You don't need to manipulate the breath. You don't need to manipulate the body. Let's get in touch with what's actually here right yeah. now. And so I can see that that can be very helpful for a lot of people. Cause I do think that sometimes I think, I think it's even more so today than it ever has been that um, use of psychedelics has been wedded with this idea of optimization. And so we have these 
these optimizers out there who are telling us, well, only sleep this much, breathe this much, uh, take these uh, cold ice baths and do all the, and, and it's just like so much stuff that I think that it could become overwhelming and actually be a distraction from how am I just breathing even just right now when I'm not trying to do anything, you know, to coming back just just into being and not necessarily optimizing. I, mean, I think it's great to want to be optimal, um, but it, be, it can become another carrot that people are chasing uh, or another goal to achieve rather than really centering on the, the just being and allowing and finding as going back to what you were saying earlier about things that bring us joy, things that bring us happiness. But if, if we're constantly trying to achieve that, that can definitely get in the way of that. Yeah, definitely. I agree there. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, we, we were getting into, or we've been in it is just trying to biohack the system, trying to take yeah. shortcuts, you know, bypass things. And, and oftentimes it comes down to less is more. And that's been something that's really been important for me to really integrate and understand for myself is less is more. What does that really mean to me? How can I really implement that in my life? It's not about doing 10 things a day. I rather do one thing that I'm really actually doing than saying I'm doing all these things and going through this checklist of, okay, I did this, I did that, I did this. It, it, it takes us more out of us than actually brings us into us. Yeah. It actually makes me think of something that occurs sometimes in the consultations that I do with people um, in the aftermath of their medicine experiences that I might get someone who says, well, you know, I'm meditating three hours a day and then I'm doing breath work and, you know, then I'm doing this other thing and then I'm doing this other thing, but I'm still really having a hard time integrating. Should, do you think I should meditate more? And then and I might even just ask them like, well, um, how, how do you answer the question of, do you love yourself? And sometimes people just immediately break down into tears and they're realizing, Oh, I'm not loving myself. I'm, I'm doing all these things to do the things to get the results I want, but I'm not actually just being with myself. So sometimes my prescription for people is like, okay, I think maybe you should stop meditating. Don't listen to five different podcasts a day. Maybe put down those self-help books stop doing the breathing and just pay attention to how you actually feel right now and keep asking yourself, do I love myself? And if the answer is no, find ways to turn that into a yes. Find what you're passionate about. Find what feeds you and what brings you joy and brings you life. Yeah, that, that's very potent. Thank you for sharing that. I agree. I agree. There's definitely parts of myself that, that, that needed to hear that. Oh, well, nice. I, I'm happy to give that to you then. Well, Jason, this has been a very fascinating conversation today. I guess at this point, I would just invite you. Do you feel um, that I have not asked you something or is there an area that we need to cover that uh, we haven't gotten to yet um, about your whole process and your techniques and tools? Um, I, I think that, you know, really does cover everything. I think maybe to kind of synthesize everything and, and try to, you know, make it simpler, of everything we've discussed over the last, you know, hour, 20 plus minutes, um, is one, what is your dream, your motive to change? Mm -hmm. Is it greater than your motive not to change? Two, there's two forces, yin and yang, feminine and masculine. Where do you feel like you're out of balance? Two yang, two yin. Three, three choices, optimal. Your optimal choice is a dream affirmative choice. Second, suboptimal, instant gratification and temptation. Great self-awareness choice, though, if you learn from it. Third, to be apathetic, to do nothing or to take a time out from the situation. Regather your energy and your values. Return back to it and make an optimal choice. And then four, last four doctors, diet, quiet, happiness and movement. That I feel like is a really important foundation for us to at least first become aware of when it comes to working with medicine. So we understand the responsibility that we're actually really um, opening ourselves up to um, because it is a responsibility becoming, I don't want to say more spiritual, but just stepping more in your power in your creative force that you can create what you want to create. And you have to be responsible to do that. Um, understanding the mineral component when it comes to medicine. So if you've had challenges working with medicine, integration, you feel like you want to 
learn more about it or if there's underlying health conditions that need to get addressed for integration to be effective, see that minerals are very, very important when it comes to that. Um, and uh, making sure integration is individualized. Art therapy for you, just sometimes being with loved ones, cuddling as an example with your loved one, um, singing, you know. Um, but yeah, make sure it's something that you love to do or that you want to do. And that may be traveling for a week or going to your favorite place for a few days um, to not get too caught up in, in feeling like you have to do what you think is spiritual, breath work, yoga, meditation, mindfulness stuff. Um, sometimes doing complete opposite can be better for you than actually doing that. Yeah. Well, that's great. And really reflects back on the individual nature of the integration. Find what works for you it's not going to be a cookie cutter um, program. And just because it worked for somebody else doesn't mean it's going to work for you. You have to be in tune with yourself. And I think that that's great advice for everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Jason. I really appreciate that you've shared all of these rather unique tools and rather unique perspectives that you're bringing into your work. And um, I hope it piques some curiosity among people out there. And um, just thank you so much for sharing and being willing to talk about what it is that you are applying within this process of working with individuals and working with this very potent medicine. Awesome. Thank you again, Martin. I really appreciate it.